This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder Neil A. Maxwell was given September 5th, 1982. I welcome you uh, to a Christian campus where discipleship and scholarship are uniquely blended. I salute your ecclesiastical and academic leaders, so many of whom are with us tonight. They will serve you exceedingly well. Now, my brothers and sisters, as on another occasion at this same pulpit, I will speak out of my own strugglings about another unglamorous but very crucial gospel objective. Then the subject was patience, a virtue regarded by some as quite pedestrian, but which is essential to our development and to our happiness. Our focus tonight will be on meekness, a companion virtue to patience. Meekness, too, is one of the attributes of deity. Instructively, Jesus, our Lord and exemplar, called attention to himself as being meek and lowly in heart. Paul extolled the meekness and gentleness of Christ. The Greek rendition of the word, Greek, uh, of the word meek in the New Testament, by the way, is gentle and humble. Actually, meekness is not only an attribute essential for itself. Moroni declared that it was also vital because one simply cannot develop the other crucial virtues, faith, hope, and charity, without meekness. In the ecology of the eternal attributes, these cardinal characteristics are inextricably bound up together. Among them, meekness is often the initiator, the facilitator, and the consolidator. Moreover, if one needs any further persuasion as to how vital this virtue of meekness is, Moroni declared, none is acceptable before God save the meek and lowly in heart. Brothers and sisters, if we could but believe, really believe, in the reality of that bold but accurate declaration, then you and I would find ourselves focusing on the crucial rather than the marginal traits. We would then cease pursuing lifestyles which inevitably and irrevocably are going out of style. There would be little reason for speaking of meekness, however, if you were not serious candidates for the celestial kingdom. You live in coarsening times, times in which meekness is both misunderstood and even despised. Yet meekness has been, is, and will remain a non-negotiable dimension of true discipleship. Its development is a remarkable achievement in any age, but especially in this age. Furthermore, whether you fully realize it or not, you are a generation drenched in destiny. If you are faithful, you will prove to be a part of the winding up scenes for this world and as participants, not merely as spectators, though on occasions to come, you might understandably wish it were as spectators only. Even so, why the stress on meekness? Merely because it's nice to be nice? The reasons are far more deeply embedded in the plan of happiness than that. God, who has seen billions of spirits pass through his plan of salvation, has told us to be meek in order to enhance our enjoyment of life and our mortal education. Will we be meek and listen to him and learn from him? Or will we be like the Gadarene swine, that pathetic example of totus porcus, going whole hog after the trends of the moment? Perhaps, brothers and sisters, what we brought with us as intelligences into our creation as spirit children constitutes a given within which even God must work. Add to that possibility the clear reality of God's deep, deep commitment to our free agency. And then we begin to see how essential meekness is. We need to learn so much, yet we are free to choose. How crucial it is to be teachable since there is no other way in which God could do what he is determined to do 
No wonder he and his prophets emphasize meekness time and time again. Since God desired to have us become like himself, he had to make us free to learn, to choose, and to experience. Hence, our humility and teachability are premier determinants of both our progress and our happiness. Agency is essential to perfectibility, and meekness is essential to the wise use of agency and to our recovery when we have misused our agency. Let us not brush by this developmental premise. The scriptures concerning life's purposes do make it clear we are to become like the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which in heaven is perfect. Therefore I would that you should be perfect, even as I, or your Father who is in heaven, is perfect. Therefore what manner of men and women ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. It is an awesome objective, utterly impossible of attainment without meekness. The Father and Son desire to lead us through love, for if we were merely driven where they wish us to go, we would not be able to stay or be worthy to be there. They are shepherds, not sheep herders. In that pre-mortal council, wherein Jesus meekly volunteered, to aid the Father's plan for us, he said, here am I, send me. It was one of those special moments when a few words are preferred to many. Never has one individual offered in so few words to do so much for so many as did Jesus when he meekly proffered himself as a ransom for us, billions and billions of us. In contrast, we see in ourselves, brothers and sisters, the unnecessary multiplication of words, not only a lack of clarity, but vanity. Our verbosity often covers insincerity and uncertainty. Meekness, the subtraction of self, reduces the multiplication of words. Without meekness, however, the conversational points so often you and I insist on making take the form of I, that spear-like vertical pronoun. Meekness, however, is more than self-restraint. It is the presentation of self in a posture of kindness and gentleness. It reflects certitude, strength, serenity. It reflects a healthy self-esteem and a genuine self-control. So in matters little or large, if our emulation of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be serious, we must do more than note and admire Jesus' meekness. He passed through all of these things which gave him, too, the needed experiences. Meekness is one of those attributes acquired only by experience, some of it painful, for it is developed according to the flesh. It is not an attribute achieved overnight, nor is it certified to in but one exam. Rather, it is certified to in the process of time. The Savior said we are to take up our cross daily, not just once or occasionally. And taking up the cross daily requires meekness. There is, of course, much accumulated stereotyping surrounding this virtue. We even make nervous jokes about meekness, such as if the meek intend to inherit the earth, they're going to have to be more aggressive about it. <laughs> we even tend to think of a meek individual as being used and abused, as being a doormat for others. However, Moses was once described as the most meek man on the face of the earth, and we recall his impressive boldness in the courts of Pharaoh and his scalding indignation following his descent from Sinai. President Brigham Young, after whom this university is named, who was tested in so many ways and on so many occasions, was once tried in a way that required him to take it, even from one he so much adored and admired. Brigham took it because he was meek. Yet surely none of us sitting here would think of Brigham Young as lacking in boldness or firmness. 
However, even President Young, in the closing and most prestigious days of his life, spent time in courtrooms being unjustifiably abused. When he might have chosen to assert himself politically, he took it meekly. Fortunately, you and I have had a chance to see at rather close range the remarkable meekness which operates in the life of President Spencer W. Kimball. His, too, is an impressive meekness, which is combined with sweet boldness, producing signal achievements in the kingdom. Granted, none of us likes or should like to be disregarded, to be silenced, to see a flawed argument prevail, or to endure a gratuitous discourtesy. But such circumstances as these seldom constitute that field of action from which meekness calls upon us to retire gracefully. You and I usually do battle unmeekly over far less justifiable issues, such as turf. Just what is this turf we insist on defending at almost the slightest provocation? If it is real estate, this will not rise with us in the resurrection. If it is concern over the opinions of us held by others, there is only one opinion of us that really matters. Besides, the opinions of others will only be lowered if we go on an ego tantrum. And if turf is status, we should not be overly concerned with today's organizational charts. Who cares now about the peck order and the Sanhedrin of 31 AD, which meant so much to some at the time? There are some things worth being aroused about. As the Book of Mormon says, such as our families, our homes, our liberties, our sacred religion. But if our anxiety is aroused solely over what we might call our image, then that image is an image that needs to be displaced anyway, so that we can receive his image in our countenances. Let us consider meekness further. The meek are filled with awe and wonder with regard to God and his purposes in the universe. At the same time, the meek are not awestruck by the many frustrations of life. They are more easily mobilized for eternal causes and less easily immobilized by the disappointments of the day. Because they make fewer demands of life, the meek are less easily disappointed. They are less concerned with their entitlements than with their assignments. When we are truly meek, we are not concerned with being pushed around, but are grateful to be pushed along. When we are truly meek, we do not engage in shoulder-shrugging acceptance, but shoulder-squaring in order that we might better bear the burdens of life and others. Meekness can also help us in coping with the injustices of life, of which there are quite a few. By the way, these experiences with mortal injustices will generate within us even more adoration of the perfect justice of God, another of his attributes. There can be dignity even in silence, as was the case when Jesus stood unjustly accused. Silence can be an expression of strength. Holding back and holding on can be the sign of great personal discipline especially when everyone else is letting go. Furthermore, not only are the meek less easily offended, but they are less likely to give offense to others. In contrast, there are some in life who seem to be waiting to be offended. Their pride covers them like boils, which will inevitably be bumped. Meekness also cultivates within us a generosity in viewing the mistakes and imperfections of others. Condemn me not because of mine imperfection, neither my father because of his imperfection, but rather give thanks unto God that he hath made manifest unto you our imperfections. Why? That ye may learn to be more wise than we have been. And for those of us who are too concerned about status, or being last in line, or losing our place, we need to reread those words about how the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Of course, assertiveness is not automatically bad. 
But if you and I fully understood the motives which underlie some of our acts of assertion, we would be embarrassed. Frankly, when others see such motivations, they are sometimes embarrassed for us. Yes, the meek go on fewer ego trips, but they have far greater adventures. Ego trips, those travel now and pay later indulgences, are always detours. The straight and narrow path is the only path which takes us to new and breathtaking places. Meekness means less concern over being taken for granted and more concern over being, when needed, taken by the hand. Also less concern over revising our own plans for ourselves and more concern over adopting his plans for us. When you and I sing that hymn, brothers and sisters, with the words, more used would I be, one condition that keeps us from being more used is our lack of meekness. Sometimes, too, brothers and sisters, in our prayers, we ask the Lord to take the lead of our minds and hearts. But as soon as we say amen, we go unmeekly in our predetermined directions. Meekness does not mean tentativeness, rather thoughtfulness. Meekness makes room for others. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. There are, brothers and sisters, ever so many human situations in which the only additional time and recognition and space must come from the meek who will yield in order to make time and recognition and space available for others. There could be no magnanimity without humility. And meekness is not display humility. It is the real thing. And true meekness is never proud of itself, never conscious of itself. Of one able but comparatively meek member of a 19th century British cabinet and his style in Parliament, it was written, if it was his duty to speak, he spoke but he did not want to speak when it was not his duty. Silence was no pain and oratory no pleasure to him. The meek think of more clever things to say than are said, and it's just as well, for there is so much more cleverness in the world than wisdom and so much more sarcasm than idealism. It is quite understandable, brothers and sisters, that we, you and I, admire boldness and genius as we see these qualities combined in some of the great figures in history. A merciful God has let such individuals make their very significant contributions to humanity, such as in the political and economic realms. I cannot help but wonder, however, what more God might have done with such very talented individuals if they had been sufficiently and consistently meek. I think, for instance, of the towering and courageous Winston Churchill, admired in so many ways, including by me. But Churchill had serious difficulty containing his ego, which sometimes tarnished his otherwise remarkable contributions. One winces even at this late date as he reads Balfour's rebuke in 1905 of a pressing and eager young Churchill in Parliament just after Winston had been excessive, Balfour rose in dignity and said, as for the junior member of Oldham, I think I may give him some advice which may be useful to him in the course of what I hope will be a long and distinguished career. It is not on the whole desirable to come down to this house with invective, which is both prepared and violent the House will tolerate, and very rightly tolerate, almost anything within the rule of order, which evidently springs from genuine indignation aroused by the collision of debate. But to come down here with these prepared phrases is not usually successful. And at all events, I do not think it was very successful on this present occasion. If there is preparation, there should be more finish. And if there is so much violence, 
there should be more veracity of feeling. I think, too, of the remarkable General of the Armies, Douglas MacArthur, whose place in history will also be rightfully generous. His mistakes, too, usually occurred as a result of a lack of meekness. His personal bravery, repeatedly demonstrated, was on occasion matched by his vanity. The brilliant and victorious Sea Lord, Admiral Nelson, both achieved and suffered similarly. I am not trying to fault these individuals, for each has significantly added to the measure of human freedom which so many millions of mortals have enjoyed. Rather, I am stressing how important to genuine and to lasting greatness the virtue of meekness is, for its absence constitutes a limitation, even upon those whom we rightly judge by worldly criteria to be great. You and I admire boldness and dash, but boldness and dash can so easily slip into pomp and panache. By contrast, the meek are able with regularity to peel off the encrustations of ego that form on one's soul, like barnacles on a ship. The meek are thus able to avoid the abuse of authority and power, a tendency to which the Lord declared almost all succumb, except the meek. The meek use power and authority properly, no doubt because their gentleness and meekness reflect a love unfeigned, a genuine caring. Their influence is maintained only by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned. How anxious you and I ought to be to emulate the manner in which God wields power. And this in a world of push and shove and shout. If you and I become too efficient pushing and shoving and shouting, then we are too adapted to this world, too busy polishing skills which, ere long, will become obsolete. Meekness, therefore, rests on trust and courage, as reflected in Nephi's meek acceptance of an assignment when he said, I will go and do, without knowing beforehand all the implications of what he was undertaking. Meekness permits us to be confident, as Nephi declared, of that which we do know, even when we do not yet know the meaning of all other things. Meekness constitutes a continuing invitation to continuing education. No wonder the Lord reveals his secrets to the meek, for they are easy to be entreated. Being more teachable, the meek continuously receive with special appreciation what the Apostle James called the engrafted word. And as Joseph Smith described it, the pure flow of intelligence, all from the divine data bank. If we are meek, for instance, you and I will handle our contemporary critics more wisely than did these predecessors. Now, there was a strict law among the people of the church that there should not any man belonging to the church arise and persecute those that did not belong to the church, and that there should be no persecution among themselves. Nevertheless, there were many among them who began to be proud and began to contend warmly with their adversaries, even unto blows. Yea, they would smite one another with their fists. Meekness will permit us to endure more graciously the cruel caricaturing and misrepresentation which will accompany discipleship, especially in the rugged last days of this dispensation. Remember the fingers of scorn in Lehi's vision which pointed and mocked at those who clung to the iron rod? The mockers were not a small minority, and they were persistent and preoccupied in their scorn of the saints. You will come to see that preoccupation. Meekness permits us to be prompted as to whether to speak out, or as Jesus once did, be silent. But even when the meek speak up, they do so without speaking down. I stress again that meekness does not mean we are bereft of boldness. 
a meek imprisoned Joseph Smith displayed remarkable boldness in rebuking the grossness of the guards in Richmond jail. Silence, ye fiends of the infernal pit. In the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you and command you to be still. I will not live another minute and hear such language. Cease such talk, or you or I die this instant. Isn't it interesting in a world wrongly impressed with machismo that we see more and more coarseness which is mistaken for manliness, more and more selfishness masquerading as individuality. Meekness can make another very significant contribution as it aids us in bearing up under our personal afflictions. Since the Lord has said he will have a tried people, how can we possibly endure without meekness the tutory experiences of this mortal probation. Illustratively, I turn now to an excerpt from President Brigham Young's secretary's journal for a choice insight brought to my attention by Professor Ronald Espen. When asked in conversation, why are men left alone and often sad? Why is not God always at man's side, promoting universal happiness, at least for his saints? Why does not God do everything for man? President Young responded, concerning how man's divine destiny required individual experience in, quote, learning to act as an independent being, to see what he will do, whether he will be for God or not, and getting practice in the use of his own resources and experience that will teach him, quote, to be righteous in the dark, to be righteous in the dark, to be a friend of God, end of quote. This is a sobering and revealing insight about God's plans for us here, and it underlines with urgency the need for the attribute of meekness, especially when one feels forsaken and forgotten and alone amid the encircling gloom. In spite of all these advantages of meekness, will the world mistake meekness, however, for something else? Yes. But we must not let the world call the cadence for our march through life any more than we would let the world set the direction of that march. Brothers and sisters, this mortal experience through which we are passing is one in which beauties abound Subtleties and delicacies are all about us, waiting to be noticed. Wonders are everywhere to be seen. It is, however, the observing meek who contemplate the lilies of the field, who ponder the galaxies and see God moving in his majesty and in his power. It is the meek also who notice and then lift up those whose hands hang down. Peter waxed poetic when he urged, quote, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. The meek and quiet spirit which Peter recommends is essential to our happiness here and hereafter, men and women alike. Besides, even if our being meek results in our being abused in this world, we need ever to remember that we are being fitted for chores in another and a better world one which will be everlasting, not fleeting. Some may still say, however, does not meekness invite abuse and dominance by the unmeek? It may, but life's experiences suggest that sufficient unto every circumstances are the counterbalancing egos thereof. Force tends to produce counterforce. Please, therefore, do not think of meekness in stereotype ways you will see far more examples of those in desperate need of meekness than you will ever see of the truly meek being egregiously abused. I do not say that the development of meekness is easy. There are strivings and struggles and setbacks, inching forward when we would prefer to run. Even when we make some progress, there is the sober realization 
that our very best meekness is but a pale copy of Jesus' meekness. But it is a type and shadow of things which are to come. None of the divine virtues is easy to develop, but each is possible and each is portable, and none of these attributes will ever be obsolete. Besides, what are the alternatives? Genius unmodified by meekness? History abundantly attests that such is both a blessing and a curse. Expertise wrapped in overmuch ego? It is so difficult to utilize. Boldness and swiftness unrestrained by gentleness? Such traits are as likely to trample on people as to lift them. It is meekness, therefore, that helps us to step gratefully forward, to place on the altar the talents and the time and the self with which we are blessed to be at God and mankind's disposal. The offering we make is of a gentle self, a self concerned with charity, not parity. True, there are real costs associated with meekness. A significant down payment must be made, but it can come from our sufficient supply of pride. We must also be willing to endure the subsequent erosion of our unbecoming ego. Furthermore, our hearts will be broken in order that they might be rebuilt. One's task, said Ezekiel, is to make you a new heart and a new spirit. There is no way that such a dismantling and such a rebuilding can occur without real costs, in pain, in pride, without adjustments, and without some dismay. Yet since we cannot, cannot be acceptable before God, save we are meek and lowly in heart, the reality of that awesome requirement must be heeded. Better to save one's soul than to save one's face. I have spoken to you tonight of this fundamental attribute because you truly are a generation drenched in destiny. May it prove to be meekly drenched in destiny. For the attainment of your full possibilities will depend, as with all of us, on your developing adequately the eternal and cardinal attributes, including meekness. God bless you, and those like you the world over who are not privileged to come to this campus. Depend meekly upon God, for each of you in ways yet to be experienced will be depended upon by ever so many others. I love you, I bless you in apostolic authority that you will not fail your individual rendezvous and those who, if they were here tonight, could speak for themselves as awaiting the touch of your love and your ministry. Do not fail them. Prepare yourself in meekness to serve them, and God will bless you. And I so bless you in that authority and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this program, please visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder Neil A. Maxwell was given September 5, 1982.